Good morning, friend. Welcome back to Acre Homestead. My name is Becky. If you're new, welcome to my kitchen. It is Sunday morning, and the first thing we are doing this morning is baking a cake, a birthday cake, for my sister-in-law. And I got some butter out this morning, and it was frozen. So while I was getting ready for the day, I just stuck that frozen butter in the oven with the light on. And what that does is it helps get that butter to room temperature, because the light has a little bit of heat to it. Now with this cake, we need some boiling water and I'll show you why we need boiling water to make this cake in just a second. It is kind of an interesting recipe. Not in the flavor, the flavor is so good. We're making a chocolate cake. It's the best chocolate cake I've ever had, but the technique is a little bit odd. It's my mom's famous chocolate cake recipe. She made it for my sister-in-law Leah one year and so we refer to it as Leah's chocolate cake but it is my mom's recipe. And we're gonna make it in the mixer. It comes together really, really quickly. And so we're gonna get this going. First thing this morning, so this can be baking while we go spend some time in the grow room. There's quite a few things we need to get done out there today. I have some really exciting things to show you. This is by far the best year I've ever had starting my own starts. And I'm really excited to go spend some time out there with you today, but I want to get this cake going so that it can cool in time for us to frost it So we can bring it over to family dinner tonight I got my other attachment to see. Oh, there we go All right, so in our mixing bowl We are going to add two sticks of softened butter and this butter is perfectly soft now because of that oven trick just like that Now we're gonna add three cups of brown sugar. And yes, you heard me right. That's three cups of brown sugar. This is the brown sugar that I got at Costco. And you, I have to say, I'm not as happy with it as I am with my homemade brown sugar. This has not been open very long in this airtight container. It's already starting to dry out a little bit. So I just bought a bunch of it. I'm gonna use it all. But I might go back once I'm done with this to just making my own because I never have it dry out like this. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna whip the brown sugar and butter together until it's light and fluffy. And while this is whipping, we're going to mix together the dry ingredients in here. This is a step I don't always do when I bake, but when it comes to this recipe, I do take the time to do it because we're gonna add cocoa powder to it because it's a chocolate cake. And sometimes there can be lumps and clumps in cocoa powder. My mom normally makes this in a tiered cake and I'm gonna show you that we're gonna do something a little bit different today to try to make this a little easier on ourselves. In this bowl, I'm adding two and two thirds cup all purpose flour, three fourths cup baking cocoa, three teaspoons baking soda, and a half teaspoon of salt. I will link this recipe down below if you want to try it yourself. It is really, really good. Our butter and sugar mixture is nice and combined. I'm going to sift this. And while I'm sifting this, I'm also going to add our four large eggs one at a time. I'm going to let that mix while I sift this together. So four large eggs are going in the mixer while I'm sifting this flour along with two teaspoons of vanilla. You know me, I probably put more like a tablespoon of vanilla in there. And then I just continue to sift that flour. I am now the proud owner of a flour sifter and I cannot wait to try it <laughs> next time we need to make a cake. I just added a little bit of vanilla. I'm gonna scrape down the sides of the bowl and that is beautifully mixed. Now we have our dry ingredients all mixed together. Now that we have our batter with our butter and our eggs and vanilla, we're gonna start adding some of our dry ingredients. We're gonna mix one third of that in here. We're gonna let that combine completely and then we'll start adding in our sour cream and we're gonna alternate sour cream, flour mixture, sour cream, flour mixture until it's all mixed in completely. This is my favorite chocolate cake recipe. It's a little bit of a denser chocolate cake. It's not super, super fluffy. And that's why I like it. I like a denser cake. That's just my preference when it comes to texture of cakes. And this cake, you can make ahead and freeze. My mom and I have done that many, many times and it freezes beautifully. 
So if you need to make a cake for a birthday or an occasion or whatever it might be, you can bake up the cake, wrap the cake in a couple layers of plastic wrap, and then when you need to frost it the day of the party or whatever it might be, you can take it out of the freezer and frost it that day. Now, I have never made this cake into a 9 by 13 or a rectangle cake shape, a sheet cake. Normally, my mom and I will make it into either cupcakes or a two-tiered cake or a three-tiered cake. And I don't have the time today because the party, the dinner we're going to is tonight, to make a two-tiered layer cake. So I'm going to make this in a 9 by 13 sheet cake. So we'll see together how it turns out. I don't know why it wouldn't turn out, but I'm excited to experiment with you. That's the last of the flour mixture. And here going in the last of the sour cream. This is such a rich, delicious, decadent cake. Normally we make a chocolate frosting that goes along with this, but my sister-in-law her son had a birthday party last weekend and we went to the birthday party and she made this whipped buttercream, the van a vanilla whipped buttercream and it was so good. So I'm gonna top this chocolate cake with a vanilla icing. And this is where this cake recipe gets a little bit interesting. You just have to trust the process. We are gonna add boiling or just extremely hot water to this recipe. I'm slowly adding it too because I'm tempering the eggs and the butter and everything that's in here together. I'm not putting it all in once so we don't get scrambled eggs. Friends, I almost forgot salt, so we're gonna add our salt now. If I was to make round cakes, I would oil them and then I would put a piece of parchment paper and oil that. But since we're just baking it in a baking sheet and we don't have to turn it out, I'm just gonna put some avocado oil on the bottom so it doesn't stick. In the time it took me to make this cake, our oven preheated, and I don't think I wanna put any more batter in than that because I wanna make sure this bakes all the way through and doesn't dry out. And I have a feeling if I put all my batter in there, that's gonna happen. So I'm gonna put the rest of it in a nine by nine. I could have maybe made cupcakes, but this will work too. I changed my mind. I'm just gonna put all the cake batter in here and hopefully it turns out well. This cake normally makes three nine inch round cakes and they usually bake for nine, uh, 25 to 30 minutes. This is one big cake, so this is gonna take longer to bake, I think. So we're gonna get that in there, and while that's baking, I'm gonna clean up my mess because we need to make the frosting. I was a little worried that nine by 13 was too full and it was gonna to take too long to bake for the inside to be set before the outside got dry. So I just took a little bit of the batter and put it in a nine by nine. And so we're gonna have a little cake and a big cake, and then hopefully it'll turn out just fine. I need to make this buttercream frosting in the KitchenAid. On the recipe, it says do not make with a hand mixer. So what I'm gonna do is just rinse this out. And then, well, I do need to wash it because there were eggs in it. So we'll get this washed up and then we'll make the buttercream in here. And I'll get all the other cake dishes in the dishwasher while I'm waiting for the cake to cook. As much as I love my chickens free range so I can enjoy watching them, I am so ready for them to be locked up so they can't make messes all over my porch. And right now, she's on my outdoor furniture, which is not great. 
What makes this chocolate cake so decadent and delicious is that brown sugar. Instead of just using white sugar, the extra molasses just gives it this richness that you wouldn't get if you just used white sugar. I am gonna cut this recipe by one third. I'm only gonna make a two thirds equivalent of what the recipe calls for because I only got two sticks of butter to room temperature. And I was thinking, oh man, I gotta get some more butter to room temperature. But then I thought, you know what? I'm gonna cut this recipe down a little bit because I'm doing a sheet cake. So I don't think I need quite as much frosting as if I was to do a layered cake because I don't have to frost the middle of it. All I have to do is frost the top of it. So that's what we're gonna go with. And what this recipe says to do is put it on the whisk attachment, get this butter whisking, and have it whisk for a good five to seven minutes until the butter turns light and fluffy. So while this is whisking, I am going to measure out three cups of powdered sugar. And I do need to sift this powdered sugar because it's the clumpiest powdered sugar I have ever bought. And it's not gonna make a nice fluffy buttercream frosting if I don't do this. So let's get this butter whiskey. Can you see how yellow this is? So the goal is to get this butter almost white. It's only been about a minute and you can already see how much lighter that butter is getting, but not all of it is being whipped. So I'm gonna scrape the sides down so all of it can be being whipped. Josh just came in here. Oh, and now this is sticky, so I can't put this back in here. And he's really excited that I'm making this frosting. Truth be told, I don't like frosting. I never have, and I probably never will. But everyone at the party was raving about this frosting. The look of it was beautiful. And a couple people I overheard asked for the recipe, so I thought, you know what? I'm gonna give it a try too. Because I don't mind making frosting. I just don't like eating frosting. It is incredible how white this butter has gotten compared to what it started out as. I didn't actually think it was gonna happen because I've never made a buttercream frosting like this before. So I'm gonna scrape the sides one more time and then we're going to add the rest of the ingredients. We need to add three cups of powdered sugar. And that was three cups of powdered sugar I put into this bowl, but you can see how much fluffier it is once I sifted it. And we're gonna mix that together slowly. To that, we're gonna add vanilla. The recipe says three tablespoons of cream. I don't have cream, but I have half and half. So I'm gonna start with two and we'll see what the consistency looks like after that. I'm supposed to whip this for another seven minutes. So I'm going to scrape the sides down real quick here. Make sure everything is incorporated. I'm gonna turn this on, let it go, and then I'll finish doing the dishes. Like I said, I do not really like frosting at all, but this frosting, I have to say, even I really enjoyed it. It was so light and fluffy. It almost had the texture of what you would think of like whipped cream. And that's just because it probably had a total of 15, 20 minutes being whipped. So I'm just really excited about having this recipe in my back pocket. So we're gonna get all this clean so we can head out into the grow room. It is almost like whipped cream texture. It is so beautifully fluffy. That is incredible. Now our cakes are just about to come out of the oven. I can smell them, they smell fantastic. And we obviously can't put this frosting on the cakes till they cool. So I'm just gonna get the frosting off here. Oh my goodness, friends, it is the fluffiest frosting I have ever seen. Can you hear that? It even sounds light. It doesn't sound dense at all. I think our little cake is done. 
Oh yeah, that's perfect. My big cake is not done. I'm definitely glad I put some in here. I almost wish I had put a little bit more. I'm gonna let that cool. I hope that this does not over bake on the outside before the center's done. That probably has another 20 minutes or so. So while that is baking, I'm gonna bring you back to yesterday, what we did out in the grow room yesterday. And when this is done, we will come back and see what this looks like coming out of the oven. I am gonna take a piece of saran wrap and cover the frosting. I'm gonna put the saran wrap right on top of the frosting because I don't want that frosting to get a hard shell while I wait for the cake to cool before we frost it. So what we need to do on this day is get our peppers potted up. So I am using a high quality potting mix. This is the potting mix I'm eventually gonna put in my green stock. And you can see how beautiful these plants are. I started my plants in the Vermont compost, but that stuff is pretty pricey and it's not something that I want to use when potting up. But I do want to use it from now on when I'm starting my seedlings because look how beautiful and green and healthy and vivacious these seedlings look. I'm so happy with them. This is by far the best year I've ever had growing seedlings. So what we need to do, you can see how the roots are nice and white, but they're just starting to peek out from the bottom. So it's the perfect time to get them potted up. So I just filled a ton of pots with that high quality potting mix and I'm pulling out the pepper plant and I'm making a hole in my pot and I am going to just transplant the pepper plant. This is perfect timing. The roots are starting to come out. They're not bound yet. They're still really easy for me just to take my fingers and kind of loosen up the roots and then we are going to get them potted up. I probably started my pepper plants three weeks too early for my new growing zone. I definitely am in a colder area than I was at my last homestead because we're at such a higher elevation. We can get snow here and if I drive even four minutes down the road, there's no snow. So these pepper plants definitely get pretty big before I'm going to be able to put them into the ground. But every year is a learning year and I definitely am learning that I do not need to start my peppers quite so early. Last year, I didn't start my peppers, I don't think, early enough. And so, you know, now that we're in a new place, I just need to learn when I should be starting my peppers. But I'm okay with it. I'm so happy with how these are looking. So these I started on February 21st, and they are just looking so beautiful. So I already got one tray potted up, so now it's time to get this other tray. These are my red Marconis. I've got all my hot peppers potted up and my um, sweet peppers potted up. I'm giving them a drink. When you transplant, you really wanna make sure you give them a really good drink so that they can get established. We are going to later on do something to these peppers to hopefully ensure the biggest harvest possible, but we'll do that in a little bit. Josh set up a few more grow lights for me so I am now putting these peppers that I transplanted on a new shelf that Josh just set up for me and I really appreciated that. And I am really excited to see these just thrive, hopefully, <laughs> that's my goal. When I watered them, I did go ahead and I fertilized them with the Neptune's Harvest as well, fertilizer. Our timer just went off and I think it's getting close to being done. I have one of my cake testers here and we're gonna Stick it right in the middle. You know, I think I'm gonna give that another three minutes. Not much time at all, because there's still a little bit of stickiness. You know, I don't wanna overcook it. Yeah, I'm gonna give it three more minutes and then I'm gonna call it done. It's basically done, but I was getting a little bit of stickiness on here. And did you see how good those pepper plants looked potting up? Now we're gonna go out there and we are gonna do something to them to make them even stronger going before they go into the ground. But I didn't want to do that on the same day that I up potted them. I wanted them to have a few days to kind of get used to their new surrounding before we give them a rude awakening. And then I'm going to show you what the tomatoes look like because the tomatoes look incredible. I'm telling you friend that Vermont compost and that Neptune harvest fertilizer that I've been using is 
the biggest game changer. I had Josh look at my seedlings and he was shocked, shocked by the look of how well things are going out there. Unlike anything I have ever grown before, far surpasses anything. And I don't even have any more Vermont compost because it's sold out on Amazon. It might be, actually, I'm gonna look right now because if there is some right now, I will order it right now because it is amazing. Oh, it's back in stock. The Vermont compost, organic potting soil. Okay, woohoo. It is back in stock. Okay, so I'm gonna order four more bags because that other organic potting soil that I used the other day that I got, uh, it was it's a lot denser. It's what I started my zinnias in. And when I was making the soil blocks, I can tell it just had a lot more density to it. And so it wasn't gonna stay as light and fluffy as my Vermont compost. So, ah, oh, I'm so excited. It's back in stock. So if you want some of it, you better go get it before it sells out again. And then I need to set a timer for this. I am so glad I took some of the cake batter out of this. Oh yeah, that's perfect. I don't even think I need to test it. Yeah, that's perfect. I don't think it, I overbaked it. Josh came in here and said that it smells incredible, which it does. This cake, friend, is so good and so easy, especially now that I don't have to layer it and I have to frost multiple layers. So I'm really happy with that. So this needs to cool absolutely completely before I can frost it. So I'm going to set it on the counter and I'm going to let this sit here until it cools quite a bit. And then I'm probably, depending on what time it is, this one, you know, I probably don't need to pop it in the fridge. I was going to say I will pop it in the fridge if, if I need to, but this one is pretty cool. I mean, it's still kind of warm on the bottom to touch, but the top is pretty cool. So I think this might cool in time before we go over to our families. So let's go back out into the seedling room. I just grabbed a pair of clean scissors from my kitchen. I'm gonna turn all these fans off. I now have one fan here and one fan down here. Because I have so many seedlings in here all over, I need more air movement than one fan can provide. Let me give you an update on how everything is looking and then we are gonna start treating our peppers and then we're gonna move to our tomatoes. I have decided I am going with the compost from the company A. I had really good germination. These plants look really good and I had pretty poor germination. I don't know if it was the seed or not, but I'm gonna go ahead and go with compost A. So I can get rid of these now because we are gonna be getting the soil in the beds this week, hopefully. My cone flowers honestly are not doing that great. Today is March 26th and I planted these cone flowers out March 6th, so 20 days ago. And out of 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30 soil blocks, I have one, two, three, four, five cone flowers that have germinated. And the four of them are the purple cone flower that I got the seed from the grocery store. The green twist, one germinated, and the paradise, none germinated. Those were from Baker Creek, and those seeds I bought, not last year, but the year before, so I don't know if maybe I didn't store them properly, the seeds, but very poor germination rate on those. These tomatoes, these are Jasper, Wisconsin 55, and Martha Washington. These are all hybrids. Fantastic, 100% germination rate on these. And our eucalyptus, is stunning. I have one little eucalyptus plant in each one of those soil blocks. I thought these were gonna be very hard to get to germinate, but they they weren't. And I actually ended up thinning them so that there was only one plant per soil block. And the plants smell incredible. They smell like eucalyptus. Down here, last time we were in the grow room, I planted out this tray. These are soil blocks on a tote lid and it's working pretty well. It's our basil and all of our zinnias. Nothing has germinated on this yet. I just planted this out uh, six day, uh, three days ago. Here are our tomatoes and these are Roma's Wisconsin 55, Big Beef Trophy, Paul Robinson, Valencia, and Dr. Witchies. And I had almost 100% germination rate except for 
my Paul Robitson, I only got three out of five to germinate. So I'm pretty happy with that. Can you just see, can you see just the thickness of this stem, the beautiful color of this tomato stem, the richness of the leaves? Friends, these tomato plants are stunning. Absolutely stunning. These are greenhouse quality tomato starts, nothing like I've ever grown before. So I'm happy with that. Our tomatillos, we had really good germination rate. I went ahead and I got those up potted here. This is our other tray of tomatoes. We planted these on March 4th and I had such poor germination rate with this flat. I have no idea why. They were planted out the same day, same everything. Our mortgage lifters, I had one that germinated and it looks very sad back there. The watermelon did pretty good. This, our cherry tomatoes did okay out of 10. We got three that germinated. And our red center fill, none germinated. We've got our asters, we got three that germinated. Our large red cherry from Dollar Tree, two germinated. And our dwarf white cosmos look really good. But this is something that I'm a little bit disappointed. It's our Rebecca. This is our Cherokee sunset and this is our cherry brandy none of the cherokee sunset germinated and only two of the brandy germinated i watched something on rebecca and i guess they are notorious for having a poor germination rate so i should have started a lot more and put probably two seeds in each cell that's something that i will learn for next year and then down here we planted well i did this on my own one day, I planted a ton of kale and every single one of them has germinated in this tray, so that's great. Down here is where we have our stock. And you know, I had okay germination on this color, the Cat's Ruby and the Cat's Double White Stock. I had four out of six germinate, but over here are Vintage White. Or, no, excuse me, this is Vintage Brown. I only had one germinate. And over here, the Iron Purple, I had the best germination rate. I had five out of the six. This is the last tray of tomatoes that I planted, and I planted these after I planted my other tomatoes, and they're doing pretty good. They are our Old German, our Rose Slicer, our Clementine, and our Mortgage, or our Money Maker. So the money maker had very poor germination compared to the rest of them. Here are our petunias. I planted hundreds of petunia seeds on here. I have one little thing that's green and I don't even know if that's a weed or if that is a petunia. Oh, it looks like maybe right there there's another little something too. I think those petunias, I didn't like the seed when I put them in the ground. So I think I'm probably just gonna end up buying some petunia starts, which is fine because petunias are very affordable plants and I want the petunias for my green stock. All right, oh, this is looking so good. And we'll start with this. So I'm gonna pull this tray, and this is where we're gonna start working today. This is our celery tray with our snapdragons and our parsley, and the thyme. Look at how good this thyme is looking. I am so proud of this thyme. I've had poor, poor germination with my herbs. Other than the parsley, and my basil, oh, because I did plant out a bunch of basil, but that, I just planted it so it hasn't germinated yet. The germination has been horrible on my herbs, such as my rosemary and sage. So the fact that my thyme has such beautiful growth, I'm so proud of that. And if I end up having to go purchase sage and rosemary starts, I'm not worried about that at all. And this is where these scissors come in. Snapdragons are one of the flowers that you wanna pinch the tops off. So that is what I'm doing right now. I'm going and I'm pinching or cutting, I'm actually cutting the tops off each one of my snapdragons. And we're gonna do this to our peppers today as well because what that does is it encourages the plant to become very, very bushy instead of really, really tall. So let me bring you in and I'm gonna show you where these plants are gonna start growing from now that I have beheaded them all. This snapdragon has the best example of what's gonna happen. I just decapitated it <laughs> and you can see there's a main stem and then there's the big leaves that come off the main stem 
and right between where the big leaf and the main stem is, there's these two little branches that are coming out. And by cutting the top of it off, what that's going to do is it's going to indicate to the plant that it needs to start putting a lot more energy into these branches. So instead of the plant just getting taller, it's going to start getting bushier. Hopefully what that will mean for me is more blooms on these snapdragons. By having the snapdragons be bushier, we're going to get more stems. Thus, we are going to get more flowers. And that same concept goes for our pepper plants. So I did not want to trim these because I wanted them to get established in their trays. But now it's time to off with their heads. It can be a little bit hard to do this because I've, you know, you put so much energy into having your seedlings look so healthy and grow so well. But I did this last year and it definitely made a big difference. So I'm hoping that with even these healthier looking plants going into this trimming, it's gonna make an even bigger difference for this year. So you're just topping the whole entire head of the plant off. My Tabasco peppers and my red Marconi peppers are so much smaller. They took a good two to two and a half weeks to germinate after my jalapenos and my king of the north. So I am not going to top these for probably a week or two. I'm going to let them get a little bit bigger before I go ahead and do that. But I'm going to go ahead and top, I guess these are the king of the north. I'm going to top these ones and then I'm going to come down here. I'm going to top my cayennes, my poblanos. And, oh yeah, these are all poblanos down here. They all now have officially been topped. I'm just gonna go throw those green leaves in the compost pile. I probably could have done it the same day I up-potted them, but I was just thinking that Let's not put undue stress on the plant all at once. Let's kind of let, let's just do one stressful thing at a time. Sometimes when you put stress on a plant, it'll grow stronger because it needs to grow stronger because its whole identity is to produce fruit, to produce seed, to keep on producing for generations to come. And so by cutting the top off, it's gonna signal to the plant, oh my goodness, we need to put more branches out, which is gonna hopefully put more fruit out, which is going to make us a little bit more likely to be able to pass on generation our genes to the next generation. So there we go. So awesome. So happy with that. Now we get to start planting some more seeds. I've got a couple things that I want to get in the ground today. I just got in the mail my order from Epic Gardener. I am so excited about this. So I am trying a couple different new seedling starting methods when it comes to what I'm using. We tried the soil blocks so far. I really like the soil blocks, but I'm also really excited to try Epic Gardener's seeding trays and his seeding cells. So these are the trays, which are nice, high quality, but this is what I'm the most excited about. These cells, they're a six pack, and these are a hard plastic. They are gonna last me a lifetime really excited about these they're made in america and the cool thing is they've got a big hole and so when you go to transplant them you can just push your finger in here the seedling's going to pop out and because there's six in a tray not 52 like my other ones it's going to be a lot easier to just grab this and go out and plant this instead of having to manage a, a tray with 52 of them in it so unfortunately, I don't have any Vermont compost to put in here. I certainly wish I did, but I'm going to use just a high quality potting soil. Oh, I love this. Okay, this is way more functional already. I can tell you what I've been using for the last 
three years. I, you know, kept using what I had because it worked, but this, I think, long term for a seating tray and cells is going to be way better. They are kind of an investment, but these are the type of plastic that I could see is going to last five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten years. I mean, obviously, time will tell, but this is way better quality than what I've been working with. I'm really excited. They, they are a little bit of an investment. I can link him down below. I'm sure you all know if you are into gardening who Epic Gardener is. He's got a pretty big YouTube channel and I've definitely learned a lot from him over the years and I'm really excited to try out his product. So right here I've got a high quality potting soil and this is just what I'm going to use to fill these trays. You know what I'm going to do? I have changed my mind. I'm going to use this and I'm going to mix in this compost that I have. So it's going to be half potting soil, half compost. And that way this will have a little bit more nutrients to it. If I had the Vermont compost, I would just put Vermont compost directly into the seeding trays, but I don't have just Vermont compost. So we're going to work with what we have today. I'm keeping this bag on the table because I'm going to use this potting mix when we pot up our tomatoes. So I did about a one to one ratio. So it was about one part compost to one part potting mix. This compost, because it's so fine, when it gets wet, it's it turns into a paste almost. So that's why I wanted to mix in a little bit of this potty mix so that it would be a little bit more light and fluffy for the seedlings, but it would have the nutrients from the compost. I'm trying to break up any big clumps that I'm finding in here. So I think the best way to fill these is to go ahead and just fill them one by one and then I can put them on the tray there's not too many seedlings I want to start today but there are a few I got them out here I'm gonna plant more of both of the Rebecca because I want to try to get more of those out there. Those will be a perennial for me. I'm going to try to start a few more aster flowers. I haven't started any straw flowers and I probably should have started these when I started my tomatoes but I forgot about them so we are going to get those going today. And then I'm going to start a few more cauliflower. For the Rebecca, I am going to put, oh gosh, <laughs> I don't have very much seed left. I am going to put two seeds per hole because I really want these to germinate this time. I'm almost out. These will be a perennial for me, so if I can get them to grow this year, then I won't have to plant them next year, hopefully. Last year... If you watched any of the garden tour videos, the Rebecca was absolutely stunning. It is probably one of my new favorite flowers. I also really love zinnias, and zinnias are awesome because they are generally pretty easy to grow. Straw flowers are super cool too, and I want to save some straw flowers and make some dried flower bouquets this year so that I can just enjoy the flowers that I grew in my garden all year. Straw flowers are very, very dry. <laughs> hence the name straw flowers. And so they dry really well and they keep their color really well. But unfortunately, I have had poor success with germination on these straw flowers. And I realized that straw flowers tend to want to germinate in cooler soil. And for some reason, I don't know if my seed growing room was too warm or what but i just had poor germination this year last year i grew so many straw flowers and this year i've had a hard time 
Same with my Rebecca. Last year, I had quite a few of them. And this year, I've only gotten a couple to germinate. But the ones that have germinated, I'm really grateful for that because I will be able to go ahead and enjoy those from year to year to year to come because they are a perennial in my area. Unfortunately, I I grew them last year, but we moved, so I didn't get to enjoy them. But this year, I am hoping to be able to enjoy them, not only this year, the ones that have germinated, but for years and years to come. That's the one thing about gardening is every year is so different. And this year, because I'm in a new area, totally, I guess it's not a totally different climate, but it's pretty significantly different than it was at my last house. And I have different equipment that I'm using to start seeds. There's so many variables when it comes to gardening. And a lot of the variables are (laughs) different this year than I'm working with from last year. So it feels like I'm a brand new gardener And I do have some knowledge that I can take from my previous years and kind of apply them to this year. And a few things I have learned over the years are grow lights are imperative for when starting seeds. And this year, the having really rich soil that the the seedlings are growing in and having that nutrients is super vital too. And I didn't really know that the first couple years. So I'm just really looking forward to learning my new area and continuing to grow as much as possible. I got all the seeds I want to get started today started. So now what I want to do is pot up these stunning tomato plants. I'm going to use the same pots. I just had to go inside and get a fresh cup of coffee that I used when we did the peppers. I probably don't even have enough. So we're just gonna pot up the biggest ones today and see if I have to order more of these pots. I've been really happy with these pots. The only thing I don't love about these pots is I can't get three deep on my heavy duty trays. But if I use one of these, this is just a lid, a lid from a storage container that I had extra in the garage then I can put two, I can put four crossed and six deep, which is pretty incredible. So I'm taking my tape off and I'm putting it on my tray itself. And then I'm gonna take this out because, let's see, I was gonna use this tray to put my tomatoes in, but I think what I'm gonna do instead, I think I'm gonna go ahead and use this, or let's see. The new trays I just got are these, and we'll see how many I can put across. If I use my recycled pots, the ones that I have just saved from going to greenhouses and buying starts, I can get three across on these, but these are a little bit wider at the top, so I can't really get three across, but these are way heavier duty than the ones I recycle, so these are gonna last me a long time. And let's see if I can get, no, I can't get three across on those. So I think I'm going to use this yellow tray. And you can see why I'm so excited about my new Epic Gardener seed starting. Because this is what I have to deal with now because I've got 52 seedling cells in here. It's going to be so much easier in the future because this is the last year I can use these because they're just cheap plastic and they're falling apart this would be a lot easier to manage than managing 52 of these. And to get these plants out, I have to push the bottoms and then they come out. I have to crunch the bottoms versus these. I'm just going to be able to push my finger up and push them out that way. But these tomato plants are looking really good. These are definitely some of the best tomato plants I've ever grown. This is a Dr. Witchy's tomato. The smell of this is so good. I'm making a mess on here. It doesn't really matter because it's going to get messy anyway. But now I don't think I bought enough of these, but that's okay. So I wanted to make sure I put my tape on this tray because I'm going to have to take that whole tray out when I go to plant them. But I think what I'm going to do first, I'm just going to fill this entire tray with soil and 
we'll just get this going and then I will go ahead and I will up pot my tomatoes. This going and then I will go ahead and I will up pot my tomatoes. The cool thing about this is I will be able to bottom water. I'm trying to get better about that this year, about bottom watering. That just helps prevent algae and mold and things growing on top of the soil. Now that the plants are getting a little bit bigger, they shade out the soil, so you don't have to worry about that quite as much, especially on things like my cabbage and cauliflower. Those plants are so big, they are so grateful to have bigger pots, but they are ready to go outside. As soon as I can, I'm going to put them outside. See, I can perfectly fit four on this tray. Here we go. I am going to start with my Wisconsin 55 tomato. And look at the roots on this. This thing is stunning. So what I'm gonna do with all my tomatoes before I plant them is I'm gonna cut off these first two leaves. And then I'm gonna make a big hole. Maybe I should have filled these as I went instead of now. And I'm gonna put this tomato plant as far down into there as I can. Hmm, that's not what I wanted to do. Let's see. What I should have done is I should have filled these halfway. Yep, that's what I should have done. And then taken the soil and filled it the rest of the way. Because what you want to do when you're planting tomato plants is you want to bury them pretty deep, basically up until the true leaves just like that. So we went from this plant being this tall to now that tall. Can you see the difference there? So what I think I'm gonna do is empty all of these until they are half empty so that I can easily go ahead and get these nice and buried super deep. These are the Wisconsin 55. This is a beautiful, beautiful hybrid slicing tomato. Just a big, nice, beautiful, red, classic tomato. Maybe instead of dumping all of them out, I'll just dump them out as I go onto these ones up here. I end up not needing to purchase any more of these four inch pots, which I was really glad about because I was able to transplant the cold weather crops that we started that I ended up having to up pot into four inch pots into the garden because we ended up getting soil in the garden beds. And so I was able to get the cabbage, broccoli, cauliflower, kale, and things like that out into the garden, which was great. And so because I was able to do that, I was able to then use those pots that I had those starts in and was able to transplant my tomatoes into those pots. But they were in their two inch soil blocks for a lot longer than I intended and they did fantastic. If I didn't realize my my last frost date is a lot later here, it's about probably, oh, here I am. I'm separating two <laughs> tomato plants that were in one block. I cannot call any starts. So I probably have way, 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 way more tomato plants than I need to grow a year's worth of tomatoes for Josh and I. So I'm going to end up probably gifting a lot of these plants away to my mother-in-law, my mom, my neighbor who's a gardener, and I might put some up on Facebook Marketplace or something like that because <laughs> I know that I have way more tomato plants than I need. But where was I going with this? I forgot. I was talking about... Goodness. That's right. We were talking about last frost dates. So at my last house, my last frost date was... March 31st, and I know that from experience, I should never trust the last frost date, and I would usually plant out uh, mid-April, and then I was usually safe for not having a frost. And at this house, my last frost date is April 16th, and I am going to give it 
another two weeks after that before I plant any of my tomatoes out. And because I started my tomatoes a little too early, my tomato plants end up getting really, really big. They're still not in the ground and they are massive. And they did so well in those two inch soil blocks. I did end up up potting them, but they were probably six inches tall and they were doing just fine in the soil blocks. So next year, what I'm going to do probably is I am going to start probably almost all my tomatoes in soil blocks in the Vermont compost a little bit later in the year because I started them way too early here. And then I I might just transplant them directly into the garden from the two inch soil blocks because they did so well, they got so strong and I'm just really happy with how they looked. Now you can see I had my cabbage and cauliflower and broccoli. I ended up having to up pot those into four inch pots. And in an ideal world, if I had had soil in my garden beds, I would not have had to do that. I would have just let them grow out to a pretty good size in one of the 52 inch cells or my new Epic Gardener trays. And then I would take them and put them directly from that into the garden, but I didn't have soil in my garden beds yet at that point. So I wasn't able to do that. But these are all things that I'm gonna take learning this year and I'm gonna to apply to next year. And I have an entire lifetime to keep growing in my garden. So anything that doesn't succeed this year, we can try again next year. I just ran out of my four inch pots. So I'm going to have to wait to plant up the rest of my tomatoes. I did something a little special here. I went through and I picked the varieties that were the biggest when it comes to the tomatoes because I wanted to get them in a pot. But I do have a couple that are a little bit on the small side. So I'm going to show you what I did since I went ahead and potted them up anyway. I probably could have waited and not planted up or up potted my Rebecca and my Aster flowers, but I already did that and I'm not going to disturb them. I'll just have to get some more pots. My Paul Robinson and these cherry tomatoes that I have, they're a little bit on the small side, so I buried them deeper down in the pot so when they grow, what I'll be able to do is add a little bit more soil to them. So you can see this is probably about an inch and a half down this pot. When this Paul Robinson tomato plant gets this tall, I'll go ahead and put more soil and I will bury it. That will help strengthen it versus this is a Valencia tomato, a yellow tomato. It's big and strong and I didn't do that to that because I already had to bury it deep down into that pot. Now one thing I just discovered that I'm absolutely thrilled with, these are the few tomato plants that I still have left that I need to up pot here. And I need to go ahead and put my label on here so I don't forget what it is. This is my big beef and my trophy tomatoes. Plus this is a Valencia and I don't remember what this one is. I was just not gonna up pot that one, but I probably will now that I'm gonna go get some more of those four inch pots, but I have to order them. So they won't be here for a while, but I just discovered that my new Epic Gardener trays, which I absolutely love, fit my old 52 inch seedling tray. So I might be able to get another year or two out of these 52 inch cells. Even though I am excited, I'm, I'm gonna like these I think a lot better. I just won't have to toss these ones yet because I'll be able to use these trays with my recycled ones. So I'm really excited about that. I'm really excited to finally invest in gardening equipment that's gonna last. Because the first year I purchased very, the cheapest stuff I could find and most of it is already in the garbage in a landfill somewhere because it just didn't last. And the Epic Gardener trays are fantastic. These seed cells I think are gonna be fantastic. I do like these trays that I have too, that these are ones, I think these are from Bootstrap Farmer I got these off Amazon too. I absolutely love them. They're going to last me years and years. And I'm just excited that I am investing in things that are going to last years and years. Just like my new lights that I have. They are great. I'm really happy with them. And I'm just really excited with the progress. So I think that that's all I can do today. So I'm going to get this stuff put under the grow lights. I did. You would be so proud of me. I have labeled every single um, what is this called? Four inch pot so that I know what it is. I 
right now know every single thing that is in here. I have not lost track yet, which is already a huge accomplishment for me. I need to remember to bring these back inside because those are my kitchen shears, not my gardening ones. I just wanted to make sure I had nice clean scissors for topping those tomatoes. Now I'm just gonna go ahead and tidy up this grow room. This has been a huge, huge blessing to have this space. When we bought this property, I did not really know what I was gonna do with this space. And I have to say, the fact that I now have a space to start seedlings, keep the dirt <laughs> out of my kitchen, is such a huge blessing. So I'm just trying to keep it as organized as possible so that it just continues to be a really enjoyable place for me to spend time. This is what it's looking like in here. I am blown away by how green everything looks. It's almost like musical chairs around here, moving things to where they fit up underneath the grow lights. I'm really glad I invested in these new grow lights because there's no way I would have enough with just what I already had. So I'm going and getting all of my, or my two fans turned back on, turned back on because we need the air movement in here so that these seedlings can get even stronger. The wind helps mimic the wind out, or the, the, yeah, the fans help mimic the wind that's outside. So now I need to go inside, change my apron, and get washed up so that we can frost our cake. Our cakes are plenty cool now in order to do that. And I wanna make sure I don't get any dirt in the frosting or anything. That was so enjoyable being out there with you. I am just so excited for what this year holds. I think it's going to be good. And as long as the weather holds out, because we got snow this weekend, we should be filling those raised beds this weekend, which or week, which is going to be fantastic. Both these cakes are cool to the touch, but look how beautiful, fluffy this frosting is. I'm just so surprised how much air we were able to get into this frosting by just whipping it. I will link this recipe down below. I'm gonna get a little bit of frosting on both. And I think cutting the recipe down a little bit, I don't think we're gonna miss the frosting. I think we still have plenty of frosting. You can see how much air bubbles are in there. It's just super fluffy. Now for those that are frosting people, this might be a little bit of a sad amount of frosting. So if you're a frosting person and you're gonna make a sheet cake like this, go ahead and make the whole recipe. I'm gonna give this one to the birthday girl to take home. This one we will bring to the family dinner. I'll bring this one too, but I'll gift this to her so she can bring it because we don't need to have this whole cake at our house because we'll probably have leftover of that to take home. I'm not gonna do anything fancy with frosting this. I'm just gonna kinda of do some swirls so it looks like swirls were intended. But I'm not gonna go through the effort of trying to make this completely smooth. So I don't have the patience for that. I'm using one of my, oh, I just stuck that in the frosting. We'll try that again. I've got one of my nine by 13s that has the snap lid. I thought that this would be perfect since I have to bring this to somebody's house. The lid is awesome. I can link these down below. These are called lock in lock and these were a gift and I love them. They're perfect for freezer meals and now they're perfect for cake or dessert that you need to bring to someone's house. And the reason I wanted to use this one in particular, not just because of the lid, but because of the shape. See how it, the sides come straight up? I've had issues baking cakes in a nine by 13, just a traditional Pyrex one where the sides kind of flare like that because the side edge pieces get overcooked before the center does. And I think that this is 
perfect for exactly what we need. So I'll just put a piece of saran wrap over this and bring that as well. And I just wanna thank you for taking time out of your day to spend time with me. If you were interested in this cake recipe or the frosting recipe, I will link it down below. And I just wanna say thank you for being you. Thank you for being here. And I can't wait to see you next time. If you enjoyed this, I'll pop a couple of my other videos you can go enjoy between now and my next upload. Hope you're having a fantastic day. Bye, friend.